Well, good morning or oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our, our lunchtime bug for this 1st of June uh, 2021. Um, we've got some fantastic uh, presenters today. We've got Suzanne dialing all the way in from the USA, um, from California, I think, um, to give us a rundown on because. Uh, Customer development program and a few other bits and pieces that she's involved with with Bluebeam. Um, we've got Ben, and we've also got Gabor giving us a really fantastic rundown on some cool stuff he's been working on. Um, to start off the meeting, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country um, and acknowledge the traditional owners, uh, most notably in Australia, and even even overseas where appropriate. Um, and and on the land in which we celebrate and, and hold our meeting today, uh, their elders past, present, um, and future. So, just a quick rundown on the seed bug. Um, I'm sure some of you have already heard this before, but we're, we're providing a platform to to talk about uh, Bluebeam and also expanding into the the digital environment um, and looking at sharing some ideas and. In creating a, a friendly and an inclusive environment to, to do that. So, um, so the champs, uh, there's me, um, and there's a few other characters, Ben, Nick, I mean, Trudy and David, and we all sort of collaborate to, 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 to get these meetings, get these meetings out to you. Um, as we're virtual, we're also your hosts. So, um, that, that makes things easier. But leading on to, to, to who's who's presenting today, and as I said, we've got some, some fantastic people up on, on our on our bill. Um, we've got Suzanne, who's the leader in product design research at Bluebeam. Uh, we've got Ben uh, giving us some fantastic tips and tricks on how to enhance your use of Bluebeam. Um, and we've also got Gabor, um, who's based in Brisbane with DBM Furcon, and he's going to sort of Give us a bit of a rundown on, I suppose, the Nemechek universe as it applied to uh, a very large project that's happening in Brisbane um, called Queen's Wharf um, and, and, and other ones. Um, but yeah, I can't wait to hear what what he has to say. But without, and also too, something that we'll do probably towards the end. We might even do it now, actually. Um, we are having a giveaway today um, of a fantastic book by a regular contributor to the Sidbug and also the Melbug as well, um, Deepak Manini. Um, Manini. Uh, his book, Up and Running with Bluebeam Review 20, very, very good book, highly recommended. It has a whole pile of other titles um, for a whole pile of other applications um, as well. So please check it out. Uh, his page on the DDM Designs website. But I will do a quick thing. I've got a bag of things, bag of tickets here, name, even a bit of a shake. Hopefully, it will be all taken up and draw a name out that hopefully is not mine because mine's not in here. Not looking. Uh, here we got Steve Ho. So he actually works here with me. Right. I will sort him out with a link to a free book from Deepak. Cool. So um, let's get on to our first segment. Um, we've got Suzanne dialing in uh, very late in the evening, uh, yesterday evening in um, in USA. So I'll hand over to you, Suzanne, if you want to uh, share your screen in. Yeah, uh, let me do that. Um, and away we go. So yeah, please share in your experiences. Yeah. Love to okay. hear this segment. Share. Okay, here we go. In presentation mode. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yes. Hopefully you can. I'm gonna assume you can. That's great. Um, hi everyone. My name is Suzanne Solomon. So um, as you heard, I'm dialing in from uh, Pasadena. Um, in California, our headquarters for um, Bluebeam, as I'm sure you know. Um, my role at Bluebeam is uh, I run the product design and research team. Uh, if you haven't heard about what we do, we, we basically try to 
figure out the problems that our customers are looking to solve and find uh, creative and engaging uh, design solutions to solve those problems. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about um, very specifically product design research. So okay. it's the, the research part of our product design process um, and, and hopefully get you all engaged in uh, wanting to join our program and, and help us out. Um, hang on a second here, approve some names. Oh, so we asked to annotate. There you go. You can annotate if you like. <laughs> um, okay, so oh, hang on. Sorry, somebody is trying to annotate. I need to turn that off. Okay, there we go. So, uh, product design and research, a little bit of an overview. So, um, if you're not familiar with what uh, we do, the focus of doing design research really is to understand user behaviors, needs, and motivations. So, what is it that you're trying to do? How is it that you need to get it done in terms of your day to day work? Um, we utilize our, our tips and, and, and tricks and tools at any point in the design process. So, that's when we're in discovery. Maybe we're trying to figure out what the problem is that we're trying to solve. Uh, when we're ideating through solutions um, for, say, a new feature in, in review, for example, uh, when we're prototyping and when we're learning from customers. Um, we use a wide range of uh, methodologies and techniques that I will get into in the next slide. Um, and importantly, the goal really is, as I said earlier on, it's to identify opportunities and to inform the design and decision-making process from the perspective of you, our end user. So it's really important that we, you know, have a good understanding of what you're looking for when you're using our tools, and we try to address that as best we can in the solutions that we come up with. So let me keep going here. Um, oops, I skipped a slide. Um, some of the methods. So I'm sure some of you may have participated in some of these already. Hopefully you have. If you haven't, um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later and how you can get involved. Um, so some of the things we do typically are interviews. So that would be where we plan out a kind of a script and we have a topic or a concept that we want to get feedback on. And we sort of want to understand the why behind something. So why is this thing important to you? Why are you, uh, for example, hoping to do this thing within our software? What What's the problem that it's trying to solve and have we solved it in a way that makes sense to you and that you understand um, we might want to do things like surveys so that's pretty obvious it's uh you know quantifying um, the impact of something or trying to understand you know how frequently something is happening to you so we understand the importance of it um, and then we get into things like usability testing so we do a lot of prototype testing uh, we really quickly build out screens we put them at a URL right now working remotely. That means that we do a lot of unmoderated uh, testing with users. Uh, we run them through certain scenarios, um, non-led, so that we get very good, very accurate feedback. And then we feed back into our prototypes and we keep iterating. Um, and then site visits. Obviously, that's been on hold for the past year or so, but we're hoping that we're going to get back to that uh, really soon. So some examples of that would be um, when we were working on our Atlas um, product, we went out into the field to see how people were using uh, geolocation on their phones, for example, to try to get some more insights into to how to build out that product. Um, there were many research initiatives uh, involved in the Review 2020 release. I use this as an example, again, just to explain kind of how we work and, and what the goal is. So um, if you look at the identify phase, it's talked about sort of over on the left-hand side. Um, we sent a survey out to learn about export use and needs. And from that, we were able to quantify um, what you, the users, wanted. And obviously that helped us to build out the features and to build out the roadmap. Um, once we know kind of what those opportunities are, then we want to go in and learn about them. So that's where we held some interviews. Um, typically, on average, we do around 10 to 30 interviews a month, so, so quite a lot. Um, for Review 20, we spoke to estimators around measurements and needs of studio users around uh, markups and things like that. Um, and then we go into the refine stage after that. So that's really uh, after researching and learning about an issue, we design some prototypes, but we still need to value validate the prototypes uh, with end users. So again, we did some usability testing remotely. Um, we had some multiple sessions around um, applying filters, adding leaders, uh, inviting folks uh, to studio sessions. So as you can see what I've, from what I've talked about, we're pretty much involved in all processes or all uh, you know, delivery um, uh, stages of getting our features out and our, our products out to customers. 
the customer development program. So this is really the last piece I'm going to talk about today. So about, uh, I'd say almost two years ago now, um, we decided that we needed a better way to kind of get in touch with end users and to keep our pipeline of people that we speak to really fresh and, you know, accurate and diverse. So we really want to speak to make sure we're speaking to a diverse range of users. So we came up with this thing called the uh, Bluebeam Customer Development Program. And really, the only goal of it is that we get in touch with, uh, you know, design and construction professionals like you, and we get your, you know, high level details uh, into our database. And then whenever we need to call upon, you know, architects or engineers or subs or any of the different roles that we we, we need to speak to, we can go in and, and mine our database of people and call on you to join a focus group or participate in a survey or whatever it might be. So if you are at all interested, if this sounds appealing to you, please note down the URL bluebeam.com slash CDP. If you have any questions about it, you can drop an email to uh, CDP at bluebeam.com. Um, and it would be great. We're, we're really looking to expand, obviously, our international um, feedback loops. Uh, we don't have that many people in right now. So please, I would encourage you, if you're at all interested, um, it only takes about five minutes to register. Um, and then on the beta program. So beta for us is really about evaluating the stability and the usability of our new products. And the goal there is that we always test with real Bluebeam users, uh, real products in real environments. So this is not the prototyping phase. This is about we have a stable working version of our software and we put it out to users and we want to figure out how it performs out in the field under real world conditions. Um, just a little sample of what happened um, more recently. Um, so there's something like 5,741 Bluebeam beta community members. You can see over on the right-hand side, the split of them across the US, Canada, Australia, of course, the UK and Sweden. Um, and then some of the profiles of people is kind of interesting. So, you know, we have a pretty broad mix of uh, beta program tester profiles. And again, um, thinking back to the CDP slide, um, typically the people that are in the CDP are also in our beta. So if you register for one, you can be uh, added to the other. So again, if you'd like to be part of either of those programs, please um, get in touch. Um, and the beta program is uh, coming up again. Um, we have a separate URL for it as well. As I said, you can either register through the CDP or you can go to bluebeam.com slash beta. They're kind of interchangeable. Um, and if you have any questions, it's beta test um, at bluebeam.com. So again, if you know anyone, colleagues, et cetera, um, you know, people within your network who you think might be interested in, please uh, share that URL with them. And with that, um, that is my presentation. I'm happy to take any uh, quick questions if anybody has any. Otherwise, um, we can move on to the next speaker. Questions for anyone? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Jenna. That was amazing. Yeah, really good to see that. Program programs rather happening, and I'd imagine the next iteration of blue beams you about to sort of hit. Yes. Um, yeah, I can actually give you a little um, uh, sort of a sneak peek into what we're working on. So um, actually right now, last week, we are deep in the midst of uh, getting review 21 ready to go. Um, so that is happening. Um, we started work on that. Obviously, it's been going on for a while, but in terms of my role, my team, we've started doing some some prototyping and some testing on that. Um, equally, we're also actively working on the cloud offerings. So um, we have one offering that's available right now, only really in the US market. You may have heard about it. It's called Project Rover. Um, that in and of itself is going to form the basis for our kind of future move into the cloud and SaaS. So the way to think about it is that like a lot of the software tools you use, we want to be able to offer that kind of end-to-end -end seamless experience so that you can go from your phone to review on your desktop to your iPad to you know whatever other you know, tools you might be using, whatever other devices you might be using, and have all of your work follow you around. So that's going to involve things like cloud storage, um, studio sessions being available, for example, in a browser environment as well as in a desktop environment. Um, so we're really, really uh, busy and excited that that work um, is underway. Um, it's hoped that we'll have something out around the fall in 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 a in a beta capacity. Um, not probably not 
yet for an international market, but that's that's still up in the air and TBD. So hopefully when we know more about that, uh, we can engage, um, you know, with the Australian market and look at getting beta users and things like that involved. So stay tuned. There's a lot of really exciting stuff coming up. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you know, reach out to to your contact um, in, in the Bluebeam office in Australia and they'll get in touch with us and we'll try to answer any questions. So. Right. Um, um, yeah, look, thanks. Thanks again for your for dialing in. Um, no it's very late and, and I think it's a public holiday in, uh, yeah, that's uh, no problem. in the US. So <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming in and I really yeah, appreciate that. Of course. Um, I'm going to stay in and listen anyway. So thank you for inviting me. It's great. Great. Thank you. Right. Um, so yeah, I'll just share my screen back in and we'll just switch back over um, just briefly. Um, so. So yeah, next segment is from Ben, uh, another regular contributor to to our to our bug. Um, just going to go through. I, I think he's just going to go through some really cool tips and tricks that he's found in recent times. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I'll just hand it over to him. And yeah, floor is yours, Ben. Yep. Uh, thanks, Russell. Hopefully, everyone can hear me fine. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Good. good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, wherever anyone is, or etc. Um, I am going to share my screen. I'm going to do this at a pretty like sort of um, low level, so uh, it's used for people who are, um, have used Bluebeam before or uh, or pretty new to it. Uh, hopefully, you're seeing the right screen. You should be seeing my Bluebeam. Uh, let me know if it's not up. Anyhow, um, I will press on. You got it. Uh, assuming that it's all okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to go through a couple little uh, tips and tricks. Um, again, some of this might be what people use every day. Some of that might be uh, new to some people. Uh, I'll just go through it. Uh, please feel free to put any questions in the chat or I'll just review them afterwards. I'm um, just going to go through about four or five tips or tricks. I'll uh, just spend about 20 minutes going through them. Uh, one of the first things I want to go through is just a, a bit of a simple snapshot. So just how we can uh, snapshot content, place content, edit that content and uh, a couple of the different snapshot options. Uh, so this is a reasonably simple data set. It is the uh, Bluebeam uh, training data set. So it's a reasonably simple data set and I'll just go through it a bit now. So uh, for instance, if we wanted to grab one of these uh, toilet cubicles and uh, just place it in here, for instance, uh, you can see at the moment that I do have a couple of, um, high, well, I've got a highlight markup. I've actually done a count of those toilets and I've done that. So if I take a normal snapshot and these are under the edit tab and we have snapshot here. So if I just use the normal snapshot and again, I've uh, put that in my tool toolbar over here on the right. So if I take a snapshot just of that cubicle, again, it's always um, definitely better to, if you close that, the sort of rectangle you're picking as small as possible uh, to what you want. Uh, so I've now got that snapshot and it is just a matter of control V or to paste that back in. So you can paste it in place, which will put it exactly in that same place. And then you can move it from there. So that is actually put it in exactly the same place. And I can move that and realign. Uh, one of the issues with this is it obviously has taken the markup with it. So I just want the basic toilet. Uh, of course, that would be a bit confusing because it wouldn't be counted in the count. So, um, and it would look like it was. So when you're doing that, you do need to make sure that you come down to the PDF content here and you can actually snapshot the content, not the plain snapshot, which will just contact, get the area itself. Now as well, you can also sort of use the workaround with that where you could come into the markups list here and you could hide all your markups. So you could hide all your markups and then take the snapshot and then turn the markups back on. But it would be preferable to use the edit and PDF content and to actually snapshot that content. So if I do that, that's going to actually snapshot the content and not the markups. So if I now just paste that and I'm just going to use control V instead of pasting in place, and you can see how that's pasted that in and hasn't grabbed the markup. 
with it. Now I might want to have that in this corner here. So again, I can rotate that. You do get that angle where you can easily rotate that 180 degrees and then move that and it will snap in place. So you can see how I'm actually able to place that in quite accurately. Um, one of the other things is you may want to sort of start to edit this content. So you might want to, uh, we might want to get rid of this, um, uh, whatever that is there. <laughs> Just, I think it's a bit of a, a footing for the uh, cubicle. So we might want to get rid of that bit and even throw a line in to sort of close this wall up a little bit better. Now it does get a little bit tricky. So the best way I find to do it is to actually flatten that markup. So we can select this markup itself. Go into, um, uh, it's under document and it's flatten. And I can actually flatten that and flatten just that currently selected markup. Now you can also allow that document recovery if you wish. Um, I, I generally tend to use this. The only reason I wouldn't use that is if I'm um, flattening on my markup and I'm sending it to like a sub consultant and I do want them to not be able to unflatten or use my markups. I just want to give them that basic drawing. So that's why I would disallow markup recovery. But uh, if I'm using it internally, of course, I would want to have it that I can unflatten it and repair it again quickly. So I'm just going to flatten that one. And that is now actually not a markup, so it can't be selected. And again, I can come back and use my PDF content to then erase that content and get rid of that little bit there. And even to the point, um, getting rid of a bit more. Now, one thing with this as well is that a lot of people, um, you know, start to think, well, this is sort of tampering with the drawing. Um, I can't tell if this was on the original drawing or if it was part of the old one or if it was um, an addition. So what it can be a good idea to, and I'm just uh, fixing off those uh, bits there. So again, hold shift down to select multiple. And I can change those to a black line. Uh, yeah, so if, if you did want to um, make it look like it was actually a new addition, uh, you can actually change the colors. So if I select that, um, now, again, I can't select it because I've actually flattened it. So again, I could come into edit and actually unflatten. So again, document and unflatten, which would give me that control back over that element. which is working pretty well. Uh, yeah, so I'll just paste that in again. I'll just paste it over in this corner. So if I did want to um, change the color of this to actually make it look like an addition rather than actually a, um, a, a markup. So what I can do is come in here to the color processing. So I can do this again by right clicking, remember, um, Always, if in doubt, right click it out is one of the good mantras to have with Bluebeam. So I can change the colors, uh, which is the same through here. And I can actually then pick up those source colors and actually pick up the black in that. So if you do have a multi sort of colored markup, you, you will get all, all of the colors through here. And that can work real well, um, particularly if you're using like a architectural drawing and you're trying to bring in it and you may not want their dimensions. And if their dimensions are in blue, if you've taken that directly, you can basically turn the blue dimensions to a white and that will hide the dimensions. So it can be a great way to sort of work with uh, consultants drawings. So I'm just going to change everything that was black and I'm going to make it red to make it look like a markup. You get the preview here to sort of see what's happening and that will actually paste that in as a, um, markup so then it does look like a, a new um item 
Uh, that's that's about it with that. You can also change the background. So you can see here that it's got the grid line through it. Now, this would be commonly used if you were going to uh, paste in like the facade or something like that, or paste something over the, the facade. Now, again, it's probably a bad example because uh, not many people are going to put a toilet over the facade. But you could actually change the fill of that. So you can see how it's um, being obstructed by that facade. So I can actually change it from no fill to a white fill, which will then basically sort of mask it, mask the background. So that's another uh, good feature as well. Um, to be honest with that, I did see a question, I'll sort of come back to that. Uh, now, I've just got a couple of simple call outs here as well. So one of the things that I like to show, um, just to sort of get that professionalism in your drawings. So I'm going to uh, align these. Now, one of the tricks with a line is that it isn't in the toolbars. So as much as you look here, you can't really find a line. Um, please feel free to tell me if I'm missing it. I've looked forever. I can never find a line. So one of the good ways to get it, we remember now that in uh, review 20, you do have the find tools and commands here, and you can simply type in a line, which will bring up the align tools. I do have that. Um, toolbar up here as well. It does have an alignment toolbar. So I find it's one of the um, good ones to use. So if I go to, um, if I grab all these, now the one it's going to align to is the one I picked first. So I use shift to basically grab all these. And you can see on the left here that the yellow one is what it's going to align to. So I can use align to the left and it will move all these across here. And I can also basically grab these text boxes and use my shrink to size to get them all to the correct size. Again, use my shift command to again align them to the left and that looks quite well. So uh, that's a good one. Um, I'm also gonna go through and just show the stapler. Now I'll just close this one. Uh, what I can show as well is uh, under document, under file, I can actually combine a whole bunch of files. Now, the first thing I like to do always is to open them. So if I open them, it becomes quite easy to just go to the files, uh, grab those five drawings, bring them in and combine them. So they, they are each individual PDFs. I can go to file, uh, combine all these, add the open files, and that will combine them. Again, you can see you can put a sort in here. So sort them by name. And again, you can use your thumbnails to move them around if you need to. Uh, that's now grabbed one document. You can do this directly from your uh, folder. So you can use the stapler. Uh, there's a few different ways to use the stapler. You can open the files or select the files in your folder. So you can grab these five files, uh, right click, and use your combine in review, which will open up the stapler. You can also access that from your search bar. If you do type in stapler, it'll be the one that comes up. Now, one of the good things with stapler is it can convert your DWG files. If you have the Bluebeam CAD add-in, it can convert them directly through, um, I've already got it open. So you can correct add these DWG files directly into a PDF from here if you have the CAD version. So you can use the wizard to add files. Uh, you can also drag and drop. Ben might have uh, dropped all. So I'll give him, give him a couple of minutes, see if he pops back in. Um, but if not, we'll head on to uh, the next segment.
It looks like he's gone. Uh, oh, no, he's back. Sorry. Uh, you're back, Ben. Uh, if you wanted to finish off your segment. No. Technology is leading us today. Um, am I back? Am I back? Yes, I believe so. Oh, thank you. Joys of a live demo. I apologize, everyone. I don't know what happened. Everything froze. Um, okay, so that's the staple. Uh, you can bring in CAD ones. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. See, I look like I'm frozen, but uh, anyway. I'm assuming everyone can hear me. We can. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, this is Joyce. Okay, so basically I've got them in. Um, yeah, you can combine the documents. Again, just use your thumbnail as we're all aware to uh, sort the pages. Uh, you can sort them when you place them in. Um, you can use batch hyperlinks. So that's what I really want to touch on now. So uh, it is an extreme only feature. So it's quite a valuable feature that, um, and again, it's just adding to those professional drawings. So if I go under batch and I can create a batch link. So if I go to new, um, I can add the open files. Again, um, always a good idea to save it first. I might just save this quickly. You should always save your work. You never know when you're going to uh, suddenly lose um, uh, connection or whatever it can happen as we saw so i'm just closing them again i can just uh do this with anything so batch batch link and new add the open files now you can see i've still got that other one open it's just simply a matter of deselecting it and going to next and i'm going to set this up with the page region so i can select and just remember always when doing this always try and select a bit of a, a good a bigger area around the number just in case it goes to like AO 100 or whatever like that, you'll make sure you get it all. Uh, you'll get a little bit of a preview here and okay. And we can generate these, um, that search result. So we'll generate it through. It's found those page numbers on those five different documents. I can run that. And basically it has created those hyperlinks. So finish and close. And now I can see that all of these are hyperlinked. So if I go to AO4, it'll take me straight to it. Uh, if I go to AO1, uh, I'm on AO1. If I go to AO2, it'll take me straight to it, etc. Um, if I go to a section, so if I do go to my floor plans, uh, it will pick up the sections as well. So it's just a good way to very easily get in those um, batch hyperlinks. It works very well for a large drawing set as well. So uh, it's a great tool to use. Uh, remembering then you can use your stamps. Uh, put on our draft print and date. Drop that in here. And remember, it's always a very simple thing to just select a stamp or select any markup. If you want to copy it to other pages, you can right click and apply that to all pages or apply that to selected pages. Apply it to all, and you'll see how that markup has actually gone to every single page. So uh, that's just a few of the tips and tricks I had. So really just the snapshot tools, um, aligning those markups, which is a great tool to use to make sure that they, your drawings look professional, um, the stapler, and the batch hyperlinking. Um, I do apologize for my dropout. I joys of a live demo, Russell. Oh, good, mate. No, that's, that's fine. No, you, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for, for sharing those tricks, those tips. Um, they're really, really good. Um, but yeah, look, we've also recorded this, so, um, yeah, which we'll share on YouTube in a few weeks, um, or a week or so. Um, and yes, so people can obviously go back and, um, Go back and 
find the information. Yep. And um, fast forward the crash. Fast forward the crash. Sorry. Um, I won't even chop that out so they don't even need to see that. Um, oh, let me just share my screen back in. Uh, bear with me. Um, on to our last segment, um, got Gabor um, from uh, Building Smart, no, DBN Virgin, sorry, um, who's going to give us a, a, a quick rundown on some really cool stuff that he's been doing on whole variety projects, uh, and also um, the mega talk in Brisbane. Over to you, Gabor. Thank you, Russell. I was a uh afraid for a second when Ben dropped off that I will uh, need to complete his presentation, although combine is probably one of the functions that I could have confidently covered uh, in, in Bluebeam. I have to admit that I'm not a Bluebeam power user by any means. Uh, I'm a fan though, so I'll let me just share my screen and talk a little bit about um, Queen's Wharf. Please let me know if you see my screen. I'm conscious that uh, I might be the last oh, thing before you and your lunches as well, uh, or in Susan's case, you and your dinner. So um, I'll I'll try to sort of just scratch the surface and and run through the presentation real quick. A um, bit of an introduction of who we are at DBM work on through just current and recent engagements. Uh, we are on a couple of uh, large scale projects at the moment. The one that I would like to talk about is Queens Wharf. We normally do engineering consulting on the client side for both uh, private and government sector clients, councils, departments, um, or large uh, asset owner operators, like in Queens Wharf's case. Um, so Queens Wharf is a beast of a project. It covers about 10% of the, the Brisbane CBD. And uh, it has a good couple of different components, uh, some foreshore development, a pedestrian bridge, um, residential and uh, hospitality uh, functions in, in the actual uh, main works uh, package, as, as it's called. Um, it has about 500,000 square meters of uh, built form, about 80,000 square meters of public realm. I don't want to read everything out, but about 2,000 apartments, about 1,000 hotel rooms in about 50 uh, hotels and restaurants, and it's all built around a large scale casino. We also have a couple of heritage buildings on the site, uh, which we will repurpose. We are engaged with the uh, consortium building this. Uh, it is formed by um, uh, the Star Entertainment Group, which is the largest casino operator uh, in Australia and uh, Cho Tai Fook and the Far East Consortium, uh, two Hong Kong based developers. I don't want to take credit for the entire project. Obviously we have a, a large team uh, executing this project. Uh, currently it's in a construction phase uh, where Multiplex is the main contractor for what's called um, package A, uh, which is a four and shell of uh, all the buildings and uh, fit out up to level two and built is responsible for gaming Fitzgerald is building the pedestrian bridge this is how the site roughly looks it looked like this about a month ago i probably could have taken the effort to to walk two minutes and and take uh, another photo but um that's you can see that it's you know a densely populated uh, cbd site um, which makes construction a bit tough the decision to um use a model-based approach to the development was made very early on uh, by the client. They have a 99 year lease on the land they are building on and uh, their main focus is facilities management and uh, making all the um, sort of stage gate handover as smooth as possible, including the FM handover or focusing very much on the asset, digital asset handover at the end. It is also a complex site with multiple interfaces, so obviously uh, collaboration, coordination, all those sort of uh, benefits were uh, also very important. It's important to mention that models are liability documents on this uh, project, which uh, brings me to a topic that, you know, Bluebeam has a very good um, digital signature function. Uh, I'm a 
bit excited about probably the only thing that COVID can bring us uh, as a positive impact to the industry is the use of digital signatures. Um, previously, it was very much tied to you needed to physically print a piece of paper and sign it, and that became the sort of the legal document for construction. Now we have the ability to digitally sign things, and it makes certain digital processes um, that you know is core business to us um, much much easier. You can even sign models in theory, although I have never seen a, a good example of that. So it's it's important to mention that on this project, models are liability documents. Um, I don't know if anyone in the audience is working in a model based environment, but um, you probably have heard benefits that are normally associated with uh, with a model based delivery, reduced risk, cost, waste. Um, the model acts as a single source of truth. In in our case, the main uh, driver was, as I said, to increase maturity in the operations phase. Um, normally, the most expensive way to operate something is reactive maintenance, running everything to fail, and then uh, fix it up, or uh, and then uh, re or like change the equipment to a new one. Uh, but uh, if if you have um, data that you collect organically, then then you can make more informed decisions and sort of in increase that uh, level of maturity in your in your maintenance. And it's quite important on Queenswolf because we have over a hundred thousand serviceable items in in the in the facility, or will have. Um, that's just a, a model of services only. Uh, the team. Keeps joking about, you know, we don't even need structure because services would hold this thing up. As you look at it, it's quite dense. We were lucky enough to get engaged very early on in the process. We work on the project since 2015, um, and it means that we had some impact on uh, how um, the delivery is actually spagged. Uh, so we uh, got engaged before most of the consultants got engaged, and it meant that uh, we could review. Uh, contracts, their obligations, their um, requirements around um, how to how to build uh, models, how to document based on models, all those sort of good things that enabled um, some accountability during the BIM execution of the project. The current project-wide federated model has over 300 individual models uh, that are submitted weekly by um, the subconsultants and. Uh, subcontractors and they are all federated into a single data set or well actually multiple different data sets that are used for different purposes uh, they are submitted in five different formats uh, so the total number is over 1200 models submitted weekly so it's quite a bit of churn on on the project um, the vcr refers to virtual uh, construction review or coordination review um, which is the process of uh, actually uh, trying to find issues and eliminate them before we get onto site uh, with that portion of the design. There are 26 organizations contributing weekly to this process, and we have 16 different pieces of software included in, in that sort of digital ecosystem. Um, for facilities management, IBM Maximo is a chosen tool. It was a given uh, at the beginning of the project. It has a gra graphical interface in uh, Forge, um, so that's, that's sort of the the end end goal that's the goal post uh, where uh, where we need to take all all this data if i look at the overall technology map this is something that we normally define on each of our uh, projects to enable collaboration uh, then we have you can see like if if, if we talk nemacek uh, group which you know i'm we advertise as dbm work on we advertise a, a software agnostic and independent um approach and uh, try to work with best of breed software for everything. Uh, but I secretly have, uh, you know, let me check that to on my chest, uh, sort of, I'm, I'm an ex Graphisoft guy. Uh, so I have to admit that I have a bit of a soft spot for, uh, for Nemechek tools in, in general, you can see that in authoring, we use, uh, Archicad from Graphisoft. Uh, the data solution is the Rofus, which is a, uh, brilliant Nemechek product as well. Uh, Bluebeam is the, both the clients, DBMVs, and uh, our uh, chosen tool uh, for 
um, all the documentation, document control reviews, markups, all those sort of good things. And the Solibri is used um, as well, which is a, also a Graphisoft um, or uh, sort of, no, sorry, Namacek uh, product um, is used in, in checking. Um, you can see that IFC is at the heart of this delivery. If you're not familiar with, uh, with a model-based workflow, I can, you know, at a very high level uh, say that, you know, IFC is the, the PDF of the BIM world. Uh, it's an open format deliverable uh, agnostic. Most uh, authoring applications can provide a, well, better or worse, uh, IFC export uh, out of their native models. And, uh, and that is, uh, the platform for collaboration when you have multiple authoring tools like uh, Archicad, Revit, Techlaw, uh, Bentley, uh, Tools, 12D, uh, all those sort of uh, different products used for actual model authoring. To enable all these processes, we have quite a substantial uh, documentation to support the project. Some of them are sort of requirement type documents, um, execution plans, scope of work, um, a BIM brief uh, that was initially written in 2015. Um, and then some other documents are um, guidance documents. Uh, we have software-based um, um, sort of uh, user manuals, workflows, uh, workflow documentations that provide at least one solution to meet the requirements that we defined in, in the uh, requirement documents. And about just uh, some of the use cases, laser scanning was uh, extensively used uh, in the initial data capture and also during construction to progressive, uh, progressively capture the as-built uh, conditions. Bennett and Bennett was a brilliant partner, a spatial partner. Um, in that, they've collected about three terabytes of data on, on the entire site before construction even began or design even began. And that was the base of, uh, of the uh, future tasks, site analysis. You can see that all the uh, heritage buildings are um, modeled up as well. Um, they are quite high detail models. We have subsurface 3D models as well. Um, heritage monitoring is also uh, included in the federated model uh, that is done by another uh, company, Monitum, um, which actually tracks if uh, there's any movement uh, around the site. If you dig a hole six stories deep, you have to be conscious that you know things might things might move. Um, on the ground, utilities have been extensively surveyed. Again, if you have a, a site in the middle of the CBD, then um, you need to make sure that the buildings around uh, the site will actually keep, keep running uh, as well. You still have water and electricity connected and sewage uh, goes away. Uh, so all those sort of things uh, will need to be taken care of. We've done a bit of a disaster planning exercise as well with uh, modeling up um, the worst flood levels in the last 100 years, uh, checking what is uh, sacrificial if uh, that happens again. And if I can believe um, global warming signs, it will happen again. Um, site analysis tasks, uh, there are various different uh, use cases in site analysis, starting with demolition. We also modeled heritage setbacks and constantly monitored the design against um, all those uh, requirements for code compliance. We modeled up the ferry paths and checked how the new bridge will affect them. Um, there are some heritage data captures. Boreholes have been modeled to see what the subsoil looks like in, uh, in the project. And then we got to a point where we started demolition. That was most of 2017 when uh, when old government buildings uh, on that side uh, got demolished. And as you can see, uh, you can see this big building uh, on the right hand side. That's where most of the those government functions actually moved. That's one William Street uh, tower in in Brisbane, um, and that's actual uh, construction monitoring cameras are are used extensively uh, on on this project to see. Um, how the construction is actually happening and they provide us with all these nice time lapses. Uh, they take a photo every five minutes and then uh, they can be put together to, uh, to actually show you a video of um, you know, how, how the building is actually demolished or built. When we get to pre-construction preparations, then the construction planning and uh, simulation uh, is or sequencing uh, is another important task that the task that the model is used for 
um, then we have uh, like coordination is uh, typically the most well known and uh, um, most commonly used uh, tool. Some people even associate BIM with uh, coordination, which is not quite right, but uh, that's still sort of the low hanging fruit that everybody benefits from and everybody can understand. So it's quite commonly used in uh, even like smaller uh, projects than, than this one. And then when we start construction, then we take the models on site. Uh, site verification is uh, is done with the model on site. Uh, we do defecting uh, in BIM 360. It's all supported by a Dirofus workflow, where Dirofus is used to create these uh, room data sheets with QR codes on them. You can scan the QR codes with a tablet. It takes you to the right spot in the model, and you can start to enter your defect. And you can see some site versus model comparisons. It's Pretty well spot on. These also these always uh, make me proud when I see that you know we coordinated something and uh, it's actually built exactly the right way uh, as we uh, managed to coordinate uh, to avoid all the issues on site. Now this uh, whole process is not uh, done by like entirely by manual labor. Uh, we try to automate what we can to delegate, especially repetitious tasks to machines. Um, and that, that also reduces our turnaround duration. So all those 300 models land at 3 p.m. on Thursday. We push out a federated model with all the reports uh, at noon on Friday. So that's how it, it works. iConstruct is a tool that automates these processes for us. We also use Python uh, for uh, certain other things. Um, for example, the, uh, the change register uh, that tracks all the documentation that's, that's coming in um, is, is run by a Python script. And then we do substantial amount of uh, auditing, checking uh, drawings, mostly IFC based, going into an SQL database and reported through Power BI. Uh, that's, I, I could not help myself and I needed to brag about our success at the Building Smart uh, Open BIM Awards in 2019. Um, that's a global competition. We, we took uh, the first place uh, with, with Queens Wharf. Um, so. I was very brave to stand on stage back in the days when we could actually travel to Beijing to pick up an award uh, like that. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's more or less the story that I wanted to share with you um, today. If you have any questions, please let me know. All right. Uh, yeah. Anyone? Any questions? Thoughts? Okay. Um, well, thank thank you very much, Gibbal. That was an amazing presentation. It really showed where I suppose major projects are heading. But I mean, it's something that I suppose everyone um, needs to be sort of across as that that kind of delivery filters down um, through through every aspect of construction and, uh, and the AEC spaces as ISO 9650 is adopted um, and, and the digital frameworks rolled out in, in the various states, uh, most notably uh, New South Wales. So just jump back in and share my screen and we'll sort of close out the meeting, not just for time and making sure, um, making sure we, we, we keep Keep the time. Um, so yeah, look, sort of just close, do a few closing now. Um, obviously, Blue and Muse Group. Um, please make sure you join our LinkedIn group and you know keep up with meeting announcements and just general chit chat that, that floats around. Um, the next meeting is is planned for five pm on thirty uh, first of August. Um, and um, you know, if you've got a great story, whether it's Bluebeam or digital or, or something like that, please please reach out to the committee um, if you want to you want to share that that story. Um, Melbourne, our, our sister group in, in Melbourne, um, their next meeting is next week, 12 p.m. Um, please please browse through Eventbrite um, to to find that um, to find that registration page, and, and please go along and see. It's a great meeting. It's some Great content um, shared by the group down there as well. Um, 
obviously building smart uh blue beam and, and membership members check are a um a key sponsor of this group and and a member of the, the strategic advice group as well um and, and um several of us are very active in that space so please check out the the events calendar um there's more and more stuff coming through now that we're, we're getting to the other side of covid touch wood i know not everyone is but um gradually seeing a light at the end of that tunnel um it's just a good way to share and understand where where things are at in the wider industry um especially the infrastructure space um a few of the sister groups we have our other sort of user groups in sydney Rebel user group um please check out their meetup meetup links um they use meetup to sort of share their invitations and their events um another good really another great group for that um and if you're a dynamo person um obviously that's the not another type of Python, but another scripting tool uh, or scripting language um, that's used quite widely um, to automate activities. Um, please reach out and, and, and again, check those guys out on Facebook, uh, Twitter, or, or, or Meta. Um, that's about it, guys. Um, thank you for attending. Um, we'll, we'll probably sign off now. Um, certainly for me, um, I'm actually signing off for for a bit as well. Um, sort of stepping back from from the from running the seed bug and championing the seed bug. Um, I'm sure there'll be someone else to to sort of uh, host the meeting uh, in August. But thank you for everyone's support, everyone's uh, contributions, um, and I'm sure I'll I'll see you around the traps somewhere, probably in the in the next meeting, um, sitting in the corner, um, just quietly listening. Um, well, thank you. Um, as, as, as mentioned, this was recorded, so I will get that up to the uh, bug YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. But that being said, um, thank you for attending uh, and have a lovely day or, or lovely evening. Um, cheers.